Good morning, friends. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor at Circular Congregational Church. It's just my delight to welcome you to our online morning worship on this beautiful November morning here in the Low Country. We say in the spirit of our progressive and inclusive faith that whoever you are, and wherever you are on life's journey, wherever you're tuning into this video from, you are welcome in our community. And we're always glad to gather in that spirit of welcome. But we like to symbolize that by taking a moment to pass a word of peace. Uh, and during these times when we're physically distant from each other, we may want to text a word of peace or whisper a prayer for peace. Um, or think of someone that we wish peace, or pray for peace on earth. And I invite you to just take a minute and pass the peace in your own way. And I'd also like to remind you that this evening we have a very special Jazz Vespers service. It will be posted on our YouTube channel at 6 p.m. Our guest musician, uh, for the November Jazz Vespers is Alva Anderson, who is wonderful. And every November, the service is held in honor and in loving memory of Jack McRae, uh, who was a beloved jazz icon, a supporter of the arts in Charleston. And we give thanks for Jack and the beautiful music that his life made. So I invite you to join us at 6 p.m. for Jazz Vespers or share that service with people you know who may love jazz or could use a good tune to start their week. So now that we've gathered and shared an announcement, let me invite you to join me in grounding ourselves for the hour of worship, simply by taking a deep breath. And let's center ourselves in this moment with each other feeling the tie that binds us and with a long line of beautiful ancestors behind us and with a line of important days ahead. Let us join our hearts in worship together. We light this candle as a symbol of the mystery that is within us, among us, and at the same time beyond us. This mystery brings us together as one. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, we are one. Good morning. My name is Susan Dunn, and it's my honor to serve as the liturgist this morning. Our call to worship was written by Jeremy Rutledge. As we gather for worship, let us honor the day dawning over us all in many different places. Let us honor our connections with each other and the living earth. Let's honor our grief for the ones we have lost and now remember. Let's honor our gratitude for the lives we are given and share in this moment. Let's honor our faith, which makes a place for all in beloved community. Let's honor the sacred that comes to us in mystery, creativity, and love. Amen. This is Judy Hammett, and I would invite you to join members of the choir as we sing our first hymn this morning for the healing of the nations.
Good morning, children. My name is Mike Marcel. At your young age, you are learning to do so much. Learning to do things like how to read, how to ride a bike, how to swim. And none of these are easy at first. You have to practice and then practice some more. I remember getting mad when I couldn't stay balanced on my bike when I was young or keep up with my brother. I also remember being disappointed when I couldn't swim very well and go to the deep end of the pool. It's not easy to learn something new. You've got to stretch yourself and make mistakes. And that's the surprising part. In order to learn something new, you usually have to mess up. But just keep at it, and with time and practice, you will get better. Now here's one more example of something you will learn how to do. Maybe you already know how to do it, and that is tying your shoelaces. When you're old enough, someone in your family can show you how to tie your shoes. You won't get it right at first, and you may get frustrated. Your shoelace knot will get tangled. Maybe it'll quickly come untied. But stick with it and try again. It will get easier and easier the more you practice. And here's the amazing thing. Once you've learned how to read or ride a bike or how to swim or tie a shoelace, you will never forget how to do these things. You can enjoy these activities for the rest of your life. For example, Joanne and I have used the shoelace knot in many situations. To tie a bow on a gift. And it's so easy to open that gift. To tie a mask on our face. To use a strip from an old t-shirt to hold up a sagging plant. You can even use the shoelace knot to make an old dog look more interesting. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for all the opportunities you give us to learn new behaviors. Help us to remember that learning something new is not easy and that we need to challenge ourselves in order to grow and learn. Teach us to be patient, to learn from our mistakes, and to try again. Amen. Will you join with me in the prayer of confession? Creator God, I stand before you as a child, a child who did not get what she wanted for Christmas. I'm angry, disappointed, and hurt. My expectations did not get honored. I confess that I find myself looking out of the side of my eye, seeing others as selfish, fearful, or even stupid and how I long for a clear sign that good will win over evil. I expect to have a simple solution, and I expect the solution to happen in my lifetime so I can be a witness. Oh, help me to remember that every day when survival is not the issue is a blessing and an opportunity. Forgive me when I fail to realize that I act out of fear as often as anyone does. And help me to admit that I find power seductive and will move toward it when I have given the opportunity. I fail to make my choices based on love often and often and often again. But today is a new chance Today, lead me so that I live each day 
faithfully, not geared toward material success or any kind of sign of victory, but rather knowing that I've done in my heart what honors your love for me and your love for this planet. Help me to put away my need for finding markers of success and to acknowledge that when I'm tired, when I'm frustrated, I need rest, I need comfort. I need to reach out to those I love and to let those people love me. Help me to realize that being your eyes and ears, your hands and your feet, your voice of truth is not something that is guaranteed to be successful, but it is guaranteed to be loving. Forgive us and bring us back into the fold to do your work today and every day. Amen. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and wide. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here verses 14 through 17, and 21 through 24, from the Inclusive Bible. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live, and so that God omnipotent may truly be with you, as you have been claiming. Hate what is evil and love what is good, and maintain justice at the city gate. And it may be that God Omnipotent will take pity on the remnant of Joseph. For thus says God Omnipotent, there will be dirges in every public square, in every street, wails of woe is me, woe is me. Farmers will be called upon to lament, not just the professional mourners. There will be wailing in every vineyard, for I am going to pass through your midst, says God. I despise and reject your feasts. I am not appeased by your solemn assemblies. When you offer me burnt offerings, I reject your oblations and refuse to look at your sacrifices of fattened cattle. Spare me the racket of your chanting. Relieve me of the strumming of your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a river and righteousness like an unfailing stream. May we hear the wisdom in the words. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to my home library, where I'll be offering the morning teaching. If you're a kid and you'd like to know what the key word or idea is, I don't have a single word, uh, but I'm just thinking about the work that we have to do ahead of us. 
I'm recording this on Friday morning. We had a presidential election on Tuesday and we still don't know the result. Uh, so I hope we'll know the result by the time you watch this on Sunday. Uh, but in some ways, whatever the result is, we're gonna have a lot of work to do um, to help make a country where everybody is included and where everybody has what they need. Um, and it's in that spirit that I offer this teaching. It's entitled, Who Belongs? On Tuesday, we got out of bed, drank a cup of coffee, and went to the forest. It was election day, but we had voted early. We thought we'd clear our heads on a favorite trail. We saw almost no one on our hike. The air was crisp. A slight breeze rustled overhead. Crows cawed, but there was little else save the tamp of our boots on the dirt. Halfway through the hike, we stopped at a clearing in the forest. It was a favorite birding spot. A pond stretched before us, a place we often see gallinules paddling or red-tailed hawks circling, but there was no motion in the clearing. It took us a moment to spot her. Look, one of us whispered and pointed toward a fallen tree trunk at the water's edge. And there stood an adult little blue heron. They are known to be watching birds. They do not stalk about in the shallows, but rather hunt using stillness. And this little blue heron was still as a statue peering into the water below. She was blue-gray in color, about knee-high to an average person, her feathers smoothed and elegant. Our son quietly set up his spotting scope so that we could take a closer look. We took turns looking at the heron. When it was my turn, I removed my glasses, squinted through the scope, and nearly jumped back. The heron looked up from the water and met my gaze. Her eyes made much larger by the magnification of the scope. I looked again somewhat astonished by the beauty of the moment, and she continued to stare right at me. This lasted for some time before she resumed her search for fish, yet the experience stayed with me. I didn't say much about it, except to note out loud, given what day it was, that we had voted for her. Amen, said my family, knowing exactly what I meant. I meant we had voted for people who spoke of climate change and its attendant threats and vowed to take action. I meant we had voted for the health and well-being of all, and so it seemed more than appropriate to spend election day in the forest. On Wednesday, the day after the election, the United States formally withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement, thus becoming, in the words of the Guardian newspaper, the only country in the world refusing to participate in global climate efforts. Depending on the outcome of the election, we will either continue in this refusal or rejoin the Paris Agreement in January. As I watched the election results on television, anxious newscasters filling in states in primary colors, my thoughts returned to the heron. She knew nothing of our politics and lived free of them, grounded in the natural world that is our common home. Yet our politics will greatly affect her and her kind, all of life for that matter. And yet our politics in our politics, we cannot seem to agree on the basic ethical imperative to care for life and to promote its flourishing. As a pastor, I see this as more than a political crisis. This is a moral crisis. Like many of you, my heart sank as I read the election results. Some candidates with clear messages of reform, running on platforms of social uplift, uplift lost. 
some candidates with much more divisive messages, blaming and demonizing others, won. Some ballot initiatives, like funding for affordable housing, which almost everyone seems to agree is an urgent need, failed. So I felt a bit sick as I read the first returns, and not because I am a partisan, but because I am a Christian, because my faith teaches that we are all children of God, equal in dignity and value, beautiful in our own right. Or if I were to put it in slightly less religious language, I believe that everybody belongs. The more I've watched and listened since election day, the surer I have become that the struggle we are now having as a country is a struggle over who belongs. Some of us say everybody belongs, and some of us say no, not everybody. In church, every week, we begin by saying that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome in our community. In other words, everybody. This shapes our theological and ethical imaginations. It is our gathering invitation. Here, there is a place for everybody. And we move from this grounding out into the world of social and political action to continue trying to make a place where everybody is loved, welcomed, celebrated, and cared for. We believe that the country should be a place where everybody belongs. And we derive our politics from our faith, not the other way around. So we go out from church to say that black people belong, black lives matter. We go out from church to say that women deserve equal rights, equal rights amendment, me too. We go out from church to say that immigrants and refugees are welcome here and that children and parents must always be kept together. No family separation. We go out from church to say that lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gay, and queer plus people are beautiful and beloved and ought never be discriminated against. Pride worldwide. We go out from church to say that the whole earth reveals the glory of God. Nature and all that are a part of it are sacred. Fridays for future. Climate action now. And these are not political slogans for us. These are statements of faith and value. They are affirmations that everybody belongs from a black neighbor in North Charleston to a little blue heron in a low country forest. Every body belongs. Yet we are engaged in a real struggle with others who say that not everybody belongs. Just think of the politics of these last years. We've been told from the highest offices in the land, all the way down to some of our local officials that not everybody does belong. Rights belong to some, but not to others. Privileges are afforded to some, but not to others, housing, health care, political power, they are all available to some, but not to others. The implicit message driven home every day is that not everybody is welcome. Sometimes the message is more explicit. Build a wall, they say. Refuse immigrants, they say. Bulldoze the forest that is blocking our view, they say. Yet this narrow concept of belonging, this zero-sum idea that for some to belong, others must not, is a sin. And by sin, I mean what the old UCC theologian Paul Tillich meant. I mean that sin is the deepest form of our estrangement. It is separation. It is brokenness. 
And so saying that some do not belong is our sin. It's strong language, I know. Something like the old prophets would have said. They were concerned with our sin, our estrangement from each other. Perhaps no one more so than Amos, from whom we've heard this morning. His words are well known, the poetic parts about justice rolling down like waters familiar to so many of us. Yet the section of his oracles from which this is drawn is often titled A Lament for Israel's Sin. The prophet's poetry derives from his deep grief as what he sees as a social order in which a sense of belonging is lacking. Amos chapter 5 is it's a strange chapter wherein the prophet warns over and over again that the people probably aren't going to like what he has to say. The day of God, he says, when it comes, will not be what is expected. It will be darker, more difficult, and challenging. It will upend the entire order of things. According to Amos, God doesn't like the way things are going. And the prophet purport, purports to speak for the divine. Oh, but I hate your festivals, his God says, and I take no delight in your assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melodies of your harps. But rather, what I want is for you to let justice roll down. Justice is what is most important, says the prophet. So if our sin is our estrangement from each other, the ways we make some feel that they do not belong, or the manner in which we are divided, then our salvation is the creation of justice, right relations between each other and between people and the earth. Because right relations are based on the idea of equal dignity and value. They are based on the idea that there is a place for everybody, that everybody belongs. And that's what's at stake in the struggle our country is having. As a church, I think we should be good at this struggle for years. Circular Church has stood out simply for saying that everybody belongs. It has put us at odds with all kinds of people, many of them other Christians, some of them in our own families. So we shouldn't be surprised if we also stand out politically for working for a world where everybody belongs. I think what we should do is simply call things by their true names, simply make it plain. We believe that everybody belongs and we are willing to work and struggle to create a church and a country where that is finally true. I realize that this will be the work of a lifetime, not a single election cycle. And since it is, we must do things to keep ourselves grounded in the larger story of which we are a part. Things like reading the prophets and the poets. Things like walking in the woods. Things like watching the birds. These practices can help remind us that we are not the first or the only ones to live through different seasons as we try to build beloved community together. I thought of it as we walked out of the woods into the sunlight, peeling off layers in the warmth of the afternoon, and I felt a great sense of belonging in this low country home. Not that the trees and the heron belonged to me, but that I belonged to them that we all belonged to each other. And so the only answer 
to the question of who belongs, the answer that we must spend our lifetimes working to realize is everybody. Everybody belongs. That is our faith. That is our politics. That is our charge until justice finally does roll down for all of us and everybody has what they need. Amen. Friends, now is the time when we collect the offering, uh, and I'm sorry for the change in outfit. Uh, when I was uploading all the videos, uh, I realized that the offering video was corrupted, so I'm, I'm re-recording it quickly um, on Friday afternoon. Uh, but we begin just with a word of gratitude for all that people give so generously, the time, money, and energy uh, that supports the work of our church. And I'd like to add just a personal invitation, uh, if you would consider joining us in submitting your pledge uh, for the year to come. Uh, if you're like me, it, I forgot for a couple of weeks and I need a, a gentle reminder, but the reason that we pledge uh, is so that we'll know what resources are available as we plan for next year. And this year we've learned so much about how to connect during a time of physical distance, how to be and bring church to each other, and we've got really good ideas and expansive ideas for next year. So we'd like to increase some of our staffing and some of our programs so that we can bring a little more church to each other during this difficult time. Our hope is to have more small groups, more workshops, more retreats, more ways to connect. Uh, but we need some funding uh, to help us do that. So that's why we ask. If you haven't pledged already, I invite you to join my family in submitting your confidential pledge. And I'd also like to remind you that we have a COVID-19 relief fund. If you or someone you know in the circular community is suffering the economic effects of this pandemic, just reach out to me confidentially or to any member of the staff confidentially, and we can get funding um, to places where it would be most helpful. It's in that spirit that we are invited to give. In times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, we need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock, this rock is Jesus, 
Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have a savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. And I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. And I'm very sure. I'm very sure my anchor holds and grips the solid rock. you to join me in a moment of pastoral prayer. To the God of belonging, we pray our thanks for the places we belong, the people who have loved and celebrated us into belonging, into becoming ourselves. We pray our thanks for the natural world to which we belong. Turtle Island, as the poet said, and all the beings who thereon dwell, members of the one common family of life. And we pray, God of belonging, this simple prayer of belonging that we may welcome as we have been welcomed, that we may celebrate as we have been celebrated, that we may love as we have been loved. And as we pray this, we hold in a moment of prayer so many joys and concerns from our lives. And we pray for all who are sick today, for all who are grieving, for all who struggle with addiction and the ones in recovery. For all who are lonely. And for all the world's peacemakers. God, give them strength. Show us each the pathway to peace. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, whose movement was symbolized by the welcome table, the sharing of bread, the sense of belonging. We remember it as we pray in the way that he taught us.
invite you to stand in body or spirit and sing along with members of the choir our final hymn help us accept each other we'll be singing two verses as we go from here with every word we say with every choice we make with the very lives that we live let us affirm that everybody belongs amen <laughs>